From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. A new study shows that charter schools produce big gains for students, but will it matter in the political debate? Plus, an Oklahoma board approves the nation's first religious charter school. Welcome, I'm Kyle Peterson with the Wall Street Journal. We are joined today by my colleagues, columnists Kim Strassel and Bill McGurn. Stanford's Center for Research on Education Outcomes, or Credo, has been tracking charter schools for a decade and a half. Its latest report covers a multi-year period ending in 2019, so before the COVID-19 pandemic. It covers 2 million charter school students, 29 states plus New York City and Washington, D.C. The executive summary of this report is only about 17 pages, so I'd encourage any listeners who are interested to go and look it up and read it. But Kim, can you give us a sense of what this credo analysis has found. Sure. And by the way, I think there's a couple of things about this particular study that are just worth noting at the start to give people a sense of its importance. So this is part of a series that is is done. I did one in 2009, 2013, 2023. So tracking outcomes over 15 years. And it's one of the largest studies ever conducted. Two million charter school kids have been tracked over 29 States alongside a control group of students in public schools. I think the other reason that this study is notable is because the very first one of these that Credo did in 2009 actually didn't show great results. And that's been grabbed onto by critics of charter schools. So now instead, there has just been this incredibly, really solid progress over the years. And so the study that people should be looking at now is this latest one. And basically what it found is that if you look at these charter school students compared to their public school peers nationwide, charter school kids are about 16 days ahead in reading and six days in math. But those numbers, which are good on their own, obscure some of the bigger state breakouts, which are really eye-catching. In New York, charter school kids are 75 days ahead in reading, 73 in math. In Illinois, 40 days ahead in reading, 48 in math. In Washington State, 26 ahead in reading, more than 30 in math. And this, if you think about it, kind of could almost translate into, in some of these states, an almost an entire school year ahead of their peers in public school classrooms. So what this is showing is charters really are outperforming their public school peers, and in some states, very much so, and especially among certain types of students, including Black and Hispanic students and those in poverty. I'll read a few lines from this Credo report. It says, charter schools produce superior student gains despite enrolling a more challenging student population than their adjacent traditional public schools. They move Black and Hispanic students and students in poverty ahead in their learning faster than if they enrolled in traditional public schools. They're more successful than the local public school alternatives across most grade spans and community settings. These results show that charter schools use their flexibility to be responsive to the local needs of their communities. And then they also point out that there are more than a thousand schools in the study that they say have eliminated learning disparities for their students and moved these challenging student populations ahead of their respective state's average performance. They refer to these schools as gap-busting charter schools. And so, Bill, the next obvious question, I guess, is how are charter schools pulling this off? Well, they're pulling it off by having a real curricula and not being subject to the teachers' unions. That's a basic thing. And also, one of the things that really helps charters, or helps, I should say, helps parents and students, is that charters that fail go out of business. People don't have to be in charters. They choose to go to charters. So if they're not doing the job, people will pull the kids out, the school will close. That's not true of the public schools. So the public schools go on failing these kids year after year. Kim's right. You can't emphasize this point too much. In 2009, the report that found there was basically no difference in the outcomes for charter kids and traditional kids. If you look at any anti-charter article or language, inevitably they will cite 
that 2009 study to prove their point. And now this is like a total reversal. I mean, if you were setting up a school system, what would you want? Would you want what this report shows? Better outcomes, closing gaps, helping challenged communities, be, you know, poor kids and so forth that hitherto couldn't learn. I would say, though, the biggest contrast is not just performance. The biggest contrast is in the political establishment, especially in the big cities, Democratic controlled, which means teachers union controlled. The performance of charters is precisely why they don't want them to come in. They want them to preserve the status quo. And so it doesn't matter how great the results are of charters, these people fight them and they're willing to sacrifice the school kids to do it. Kim, do you suppose that this report, this new analysis, will change the political debate over charters at all? I've seen some people dismissing this report and saying it shows that there are many charter schools across the nation that are not succeeding. And that's true. This is a a large analysis with lots and lots of schools, lots and lots of students. So here is another line from the Carita report. It says, across all charter schools in our study, 36 percent have greater growth. 47% have equivalent growth and 17% have lower growth relative to their local traditional public schools. And so in any kind of bell curve, there are always going to be some schools on the left side of that bell curve. And I would also point out that the Credo Report does have some suggestions on that front. It says underperforming charter schools that are taken over by strong charter management organizations led to improved student learning at the kids in the underperforming school and did not adversely affect at all the student populations in the rest of the schools run by that same charter management organization. So that suggests one path for dealing with these underperforming charter schools is to get in a successful operator and have them take over that operation and run it the way they're running the rest of their schools. It's not as if there's no room for improvement that is suggested in this Credo report, but I think overwhelmingly it is a a positive message on charter schools. And do you think that will make any difference in the political debates that are going on surrounding them? Yeah, one thing that I really liked about this report is it didn't shy away from the fact that there are some problems in some charter schools. And it also, as you said, offered suggestions and insights into that. One thing they found is that there's a growing advantage in results for schools run by charter management organizations, which tend to operate more than one school. The idea likely being that they can figure out what's working best and then apply it in other locations, replicate it. And we'll have to do this longer to see exactly what kind of formula works best. There's nothing that's going to stop the critics and those who are allied with the teachers unions from their criticism. They're dug in, right? That's a political position, as it were. And they're going to really hate aspects of this report. Like Just to dwell in for a little bit more on what you were talking about these gap-busting schools. These schools are essentially showing that Black and Hispanic students are able to succeed as well as their white peers. And there's this really impressive line in this saying that, quote, learning gaps between student groups are not structural or inevitable. Now, think about that line. That was what their takeaway was from these gap-busting schools. That threatens everything out there right now on the progressive left that wants to suggest there's structural racism. For instance, there's a permanent underclass. And instead, you've got these results in this report showing that it's simply not the case that if you get the kids in the right learning environment, everyone can succeed at an equal level. They're going to hate that and they're going to trash on this report as a result. But the real place where it matters, Kyle, is not necessarily if it changes the mind of Randy Weingarten at the head of the National Teachers Union. The question is whether or not it mobilizes even more parents to demand these kinds of educational choices for their kids and to punish politicians who do not listen to that desire. And you've seen this happening across the states. We now have all of these states that have, for instance, gone to universal school choice. We've got FICE, which I find interesting, happening in states where some of the holdouts have in fact been Republican politicians in rural areas who have pretty decent schools and so have fought back against any reallocation or changing of the way it works because they want to protect what they have. And 
voters punishing them for that, kicking them out in primaries. We saw that happen, in, for instance, in Iowa. And so to the extent that this really adds to parents' understanding of the benefits of charter schools and gives the evangelists for charter schools some more data to back up their case, that's going to put more pressure on politicians and and hopefully help in what we have seen in this kind of flowering of school choice across the country since the pandemic. (music) 